Well, thank you. We really appreciate you taking time to participate in this Becker's webinar, Climbing the Ladder to COVID Financial Recovery Through Perioperative Services. I'm Jeff Peters, the, one of the founders and CEOs of Surgical Directions, and we have the honor of having Wick, Rick Swain, the CEO of the University of Toledo Medical Center, joining us. I've worked with Rick for probably 15, 20 years and found him to be an incredibly effective leader. So we're really lucky to have his vast experience and insight into this. Um, here's, here's some of the background of myself and Rick. Um, and we just look forward to having a uh, deep, discussion about how perioperative services can help your system and your hospital. So if I could have the next slide, please. What we plan to do is to start with talking about the financial pain that's been caused by COVID for all hospitals and health systems throughout the country to give some insight from an experienced CEO as to strategies that he's found effective before in climbing out of financial challenges and ones that he's using today. And then what we'll also talk about are a lot of strategies for financial recovery and give you really insight and pointers that you can use in your organization today and tomorrow to impact the financial performance of perioperative services along with the financial performance of your health system and hospitals and ASCs within the health system. So if we could have the next one. Hospitals are under incredible financial stress. The margins in hospitals have not been great historically, a little under 4%, but you can see even with the funding from the CARES Act, that during the first half of the year, hospital margins were a negative 3%. And without further funding, which we all know that Washington is struggling at this very moment to put together, Kaufman Hall projects that there's going to be a negative margin for hospitals and health systems of 7%. Clearly, an unsustainable level of performance that is increasingly difficult because our country is counting on the resources from our hospitals to get us through this crisis. And yet, in spite of having this problem of, of having us as the safety net, we're seeing very negative margins, which are unsustainable. Next slide. Historically and currently, about two thirds of health systems margins come from procedural perioperative services and they're under pressure. There's lots of procedures that five years ago were common on an OR schedule, sinus procedures, prostatectomies that we just don't see anymore on hospital schedules because there's new modes of treatment emerging. Patients also have an influence in where they go for their care and how they want to go for care. Payers are looking at bundles in terms of managing problems and diagnoses as opposed to paying necessarily for the surgical services, which is pretty putting incentives on providers to look at more cost-effective alternatives to handle problems. We're all dealing with the HR ramifications of having to reduce our cost, furloughing employees, but then having surges in surgical procedures where we have to bring them back and they're reluctant to come back. So it's this balance of managing our costs and having enough resources to meet demand. And overall, what we're seeing is a migration of surgery from inpatient to ambulatory care. And increasingly, patients are getting their ambulatory procedures 
outside of a hospital setting in ASCs and physicians' offices, which is further creating financial strain for hospitals and the whole issue of accountable care organizations <laughs> and comprehensive integrated networks are something that we're going to have to sort of um, live with in terms of how we manage and balance our services. So next slide, please. The challenges really appear endless and there's new challenges every day. We see states today where mayors and governors are canceling elective surgery because of a resurgence of COVID cases and volume. Patients are very afraid of going into facilities that are treating COVID patients. So many patients are saying, you know, I just don't think this is the time that I'm comfortable having my elective surgery. But I need to wait and, and see if we have a vaccine and see if things calm down. There's also a problem because while patients in many cases have time to have surgery, because of the high unemployment and the furloughs, there's an increasing number of patients that don't have the ability to meet co-pays and to take time off from work. Um, and even patients that have gone back to work, they're afraid to take time off to have surgery because while they're at sur having surgery and recovering, their jobs might be eliminated. I talked a little bit before about the movement of patients to freestanding ambulatory surgery centers from hospitals, and we'll spend a lot more time talking about that later in the presentation. There's also a different motivation for young surgeons. Young surgeons are choosing employment and very much want the guaranteed salary and security and are not as motivated to work as hard as surgeons might have been 15, 20 years ago. There's also <laughs> practices that have seen a decline in their professional income and in saying, I, I can't do this anymore, going to hospitals or other organizations to employ them. COVID's also created challenges because we need for many procedures to get a test and get the results back prior to surgery. That's increasing our cost. And because of the precautions we need to take in terms of minimizing the exposure to our staff, the same procedure is taking longer to do because of the delays after intubation and extubation. So our cost of surgery is higher. We're not getting reimbursement, but we're spending more money. So with that background, I think we'd like the next slide and to turn it over to Rick to talk about some of the strategies that he's used successfully to um, improve the performance of organizations that he's led. Rick? Thanks, Jeff. Uh, again, this is Rick Swain. I've been, in, um, I've been in healthcare for some 34 years, 35 years now. My, um, my training is um, you know, in finance. I'm a CPA. Um, I, uh, I spent a good portion of my career in the Beaumont Health System and just recently have moved over to the University of Toledo. You know, it, it, as this slide indicates at the top, physicians are key to, to building and lasting uh, needed change. I, I couldn't, that, that couldn't be a truer statement. You know, administration always thinks they know everything and, and they, know, they know how to run operations. And, and to be honest with you, we haven't taken advantage of the, the physician's knowledge and to be honest with you, the, the desire to help. We sort of pushed them to the side. Things have changed. We, we've come to the realization that, that physicians are absolutely critical in helping improve operations, and they really want to be a part of the solution. I, I, for the longest time, I never believed that. I thought, really, doctors were, were coming to the hospital, they did their thing, and they left. But they really want to be a part of it. They, they really want to make operations better. So, so 
what we've also come to realize is once they put the time and the effort into helping change a program, they, they, they really become, begin to utilize that program more. They become more dedicated to that particular entity. And it, it, it truly is a, an absolute win-win. So again, I can't emphasize enough that the positions are truly the key. If we could go to the next slide, please. As we struggle to correct operations, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in the next slide, but, you know, and I'm not here to sell surgical directions, please. I, but, but they came, they came to us in, when I was at Beaumont, and, and, they, and they gave us some really good advice, advice to, to form, as it says at this slide, the Surgical Services Executive Committee. Um, again, that committee was just not made up just of surgeons, but the majority were the surgeons, but we also had nursing leadership, we had anesthesia involved, we had administration involved. It was run by, in this particular case, the chief of anesthesia, the chief of surgery. It, it, it had all the players at the table. You know what, it, and it was, it was surgeons governing surgeons. It was holding them, each other, accountable to the policies that they established and had voted on. It, it, you know, we, we worked on on-time starts and block utilizations and, and block release times and supply utilizations, all the things that I'm sure all of you have struggled with. We, we worked on those things through the Surgical uh, Executive Committee. And, and it was a, an absolute critical component of developing a good, solid operation. Next slide, please. So, so let me tell you a little bit about about Beaumont Gross Point. So this is a, is a 200, 280, 300 bed hospital. I was the president of this hospital for uh, some 12 years. Um, it was surrounded by competition, not just small hospitals, but big systems. We had Ascension system that was a, a five, 600 bed system. We had the Henry Ford system, a major, major player. We had Detroit Medical Center all around us. Um, so these were large players in which our surgeons had options. They could go to any one of these hospitals. They were all opening up their doors to them and trying to woo them to, to bring their cases to any one of these particular. And these are all great facilities. These are all great facilities. So when I came into the Gross Point Hospital, our surgical volumes were declining. The operations within that area were, were truly inefficient. Anesthesia was being blamed by the surgeons because they were late to getting the cases. Everybody was pointing fingers at everyone. Staffing levels were not where they needed to be. From the perspective that they weren't where they needed to be at the time when the surgeries are taking place. So we had too many people in the morning, not enough people in the afternoon. And, and it was just, it was not very well organized by any means. So, so when we talked to surgical directions, again, we talked about this, this this uh, executive committee, and 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 we we formed this executive committee, and and I'll be honest, I when it was brought forward and said this will work, I I truly did have my doubts. Uh, again, I had my doubts because these surgeons had options. Why why did they really want to work with the Gross Point Hospital when they could have gone to any one of the other hospitals, which were in fact much larger than our system? So so we we did we formed the group. We, we, the surgeons that, that really got on this, onto this committee were, were, relatively speaking, loyal to the hospital. They did want to see it improve. It was a, a niche hospital, if you want to say. They, they necessarily didn't want to go to the, the bigger hospitals. They, they wanted to, to help us to create a system that was workable, was efficient, and, and something they could be proud of. We brought data to the, this, this group. Uh, again, made up of the, that same, those, those same individuals that I talked about earlier. We brought data forward to them, financial performance forward to them. We brought our press gainy scores forward to them. All the write-offs that we were incurring as a result of not preparing our, our patients efficiently and effectively from the standpoint of, of proper authorizations from our insurance company. We brought all that information to the committee. And to be honest with you, you know, they were shocked. They were shocked at, at what we were experiencing from a financial perspective, the amount of the write-off. They were shocked at, at the, the press scores, our customer satisfaction scores, that they were as low as they were. 
and 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 we brought some ideas forward, some some of our thoughts, some of administrative thoughts on on where we thought we could fix things. And you know what? They accepted some of those. They 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 looked at it. They agreed with some of them. But what they did and, and was really remarkable is they they took the best of the best. So they had worked at these other facilities, whether they be hospitals or ASCs, and and they took some of the the very best performance processes in, in each of these facilities. They brought that to the Growth Point Hospital, and 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 we crafted a a the processes around again, as I said, the best of the best. And so when we were finished, and and we we began to roll out these new processes, they were quite efficient. And, and as we began to see our, our volumes change and we began to tweak these processes, we, we've seen our financials improve, our customer satisfaction improve, our quality improve. They, they became very proud. They, were, it was, they had their fingerprints all over this. And, and they became proud. They brought more of their volume. And, and, they, and they talked to their colleagues. And their colleagues brought their volume. Because this was truly, this was truly an OR that was created by them, and as I said, it had their fingerprints on it. So as the slide indicates, you know the volumes were increasing, the efficiencies were increasing, the financial performance, and 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 ultimately the docs were getting in, they were getting their procedures done, and they were getting back to their office in a very efficient and effective way. Again, I'm not here to sell surgical directions by any means. But I tell you, the, their ideas and, and the ideas of the Surgical Executive Committee were right on. And, um, and this hospital, which was losing some $18 million when I got there, is, is making a substantial amount of money now. I know you've probably read about this in the past where hospitals turn around and it, it seems, you know, just so remarkable. How could that be? This, this was a truly a, a remarkable turnaround and it was and it was really due to to the the physicians' efforts. If you go to the next slide, please. And, and that's really what this this slide is is truly all about. It it oh I'm sorry I, I I'm off on my slide. So th this next slide is is really now about the University of Toledo. So when I left Beaumont Gross Point as the president, I uh, I said. I'm, I'm done. I, I've done that. I've, uh, I'm, I'm going to go back to my roots. I'm going to go back to finance. And, and, and so when I was asked to go to University of Toledo, I, I came in there as their CFO. And I very much enjoyed that, the work there. Um, unfortunately or fortunately, I'm not sure which way to look at it, the, um, the hospital president uh, found a, a wonderful opportunity and decided to pursue that opportunity. And about a year after he, he left. He was a, a wonderful gentleman and we hated to see him leave. Um, again, I was very happy in my CFO position. The university president came to me and asked me if I'd be interested in, in taking on that, that job. And, um, and to be honest with you, I was a little reluctant. Again, as I said, I, I kind of done it and I really wasn't interested in doing it again. Um, but to be honest, the hospital was a, a very neat hospital. The docs were, were wonderful to work with. And so I agreed to, um, to, to take on that assignment. I, again, this hospital is, is not a lot different than the, the Gross Point Hospital. Again, around 300 beds, losing similar amount of money, having some issues within their, their ORs. Um, and, 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 and again, because I had such success with Jeff and his team at Surgical Directions, I asked them to come over and, and give us a hand. So, so by no means are we have we completed this task, but we've we've we formed the Surgical Executive Committee. Um, we've begun to look at block utilizations and and, and supply utilizations and, and staffing, and we're beginning to move down that exact same road that we moved down at Gross Point. The doctors are, are truly buying into all of this. They want to help. They've never really been asked to help as, as we are asking them now. And they have some great ideas. Again, great ideas that they've brought from other hospitals, great ideas that they just never had an opportunity to express. They're not now able to express them in this executive committee. 
it has been a wonderful experience, and, and I, I really believe that we'll go down the same road that we did at Gross Point. The, the, the final slide that I have really talks about, again, physician, physicians' active participation. In my experience, and I can't stress this enough, I, the importance of physicians' involvement in all aspects of, of the surgical initiative, whether it be with, with growing the various service lines, improving customer service, or, or helping us evaluate joint venture opportunities. It, it has worked out wonderful for us. It has really united the doctors. And, and, and again, to be honest, not only within surgery, but as the whole hospital has seen how the surgeons have come together with administration, the whole hospital is beginning to come together, all the physicians, and working more collaboratively with, with all of us. So it's been a, a, a wonderful experience so far, and I, I truly believe that we'll go down that same road, uh, same road as we did at Gross Point here at University of Toledo. So, um, so Jeff, I'll turn this back over to you. Thank, thanks, Rick. Very, very insightful. We, we appreciate your time and comments. What this slide talks about is really the distribution of surgical and perioperative procedures in the U.S. What's interesting is that perioperative services is really an ambulatory business. Only about 10 million procedures are done on a hospital inpatient basis, and you can see the growth in procedures in ASC, hospital-based ambulatory surgery, and office-based surgery, and problems just 10 years ago that were surgically handled on an inpatient basis are just being handled more cost-effectively on an ambulatory basis. And, and I'm an example. I've, I've known for over a decade that, that I had prostate cancer and was watching it and very reluctant to have it treated. Then about two years ago, there was a pretty major growth in, um, in the tumor that, that I had in my prostate and my urologist just said, Jeff, you can't wait. Um, you need to take care of this. And I was very reluctant to have an, a prostatectomy um, just because of the complication rate. So I um, did a lot of research and discovered that there's an alternative that's approved by Medicare and major payers, high foo, high intensity frequency ultrasound, where they really just go in, identify the tumor, and ablate it. And a procedure that five years ago would have involved a four-day hospital stay, a 40% complication rate, and a $70,000 hospital bill, I had done in an ambulatory surgery center. I went in, had the surgery. It was three hours bet between when I walked into the facility and I walked out on an ambulatory basis. I've been followed for two years, incredible results, and don't have the complications. And that's going on in lots of procedures through, throughout the country and the world. We're managing things on an ambulatory basis, having great outcomes, and, and at a much lower cost and a much better patient satisfaction. If I could have the next slide, please. What, while there's a movement to ambulatory procedures, there's also a shift in where those ambulatory procedures are being done. In 2005, 60% of all ambulatory surgical procedures were done in a hospital <coughs> HOPD, hospital-based ambulatory care center. You can see that it's switched and now only 40% are done in a hospital and 60% are done on a freestanding ASCs. Um, it, it is historically more profitable for a hospital to do it in an HOPD, but that difference in reimbursement is declining and there's a huge change going on in terms of what consumers and surgeons are asking for. 
Next slide. And part of that is being driven by there's a lot of venture capital that's focusing on surgery. Um, a lot of um, private equity is looking at diversifying their venture capital funds with, believe it or not, more recession-proof assets. And they're targeting surgical specialties like orthopedics and urology that don't really vary much with changes in um, our economics as a country. And they're not just building surgery centers and acquiring them. What they're doing is they're acquiring large physician practices throughout a market, employing those physicians as part of the joint venture, giving them equity. So if the venture goes well, they not only make more money, but when these funds um, are um, spun off, and traded, traded publicly. There's a huge um, windfall for the surgeons. It includes diagnostics, the ASC, rehabilitation, and in many cases like urology, radiation therapy. So what they've done is that they've identified the profitable surgical specialties and are managing that disease and treatment and rehab in doing an incredibly good job with an incredible amount of capital going towards the acquisition of more physician practices to support the network. So it's a new form of competition to hospitals and health systems, and it's growing fairly um, rapidly. So we've got that new competition. Next slide. At the same time, as Rick talked about, we're using metrics to measure the efficiency of our perioperative services in hospitals and health systems that are not always optimizing metrics, block utilization, nursing hours per minute, cost per procedure, and particularly block utilization. Most hospitals think that they're optimizing block if they have 75% utilization. That means one out of every four hours that you're open during prime time, you're not generating revenue. That's not a use of intensive capital that would work in other sectors of the economy, manufacturing or something like that. But, but we have these artificial sort of norms as what we think are good performance. And we just say, that's, that's what we're going to accept. So I think as we're looking at financial pressure, we've got to look at our cost structure. The next one. The, and part of looking at the cost structure are looking at, at how we utilize our, our resources. This is a chart that really talks about the day of the week, the hour of the day, and how many ORs this facility needs to handle their OR volume with a 95% coverage ratio. Most organizations staff their OR for peak. And you can see in this slide at on um, Tuesday at nine o'clock is your peak where you need 22 rooms. But in most other times, even between seven and three, you need a lot less rooms and the issue is, do we really want to staff for that rare peak? Or do we want to optimize our resources because we can no longer afford the cost of having labor um, that isn't being fully utilized? So I think part of it is looking at new tools to how we go about establishing block and capacity Next slide. And some of these tools are able to forecast how much capacity you need and also what is the best use of that capacity by margin and, and payer mix. When most health systems allocate blocks, 
They never look at payer mix and they're constantly responding to the demand of surgeons, but some of those surgeons may not necessarily be bringing in cases that are as profitable. We have an obligation to meet the needs of all of the patients in the community, but particularly when we have surges after an OR has been closed because of COVID, there's different methodologies you want to use to decide how many ORs you open, when you open them, and how you prioritize the cases you're going to do by patient acuity, the margin, backlog, and capacity. And as Rick talked about, what you really want to use is um, that surgical services executive committee to build organizational consensus around it. Next slide. But we also have to look at the overall financial structure of hospitals and particularly your high cost perioperative services. If you look at the healthcare sector, the, the margins are somewhat inequitable. So the, ha the, the average hospital margin in a good economy is about 6%, yet most of our equipment manufacturers that are supplying implants for our surgeries have a margin that's more than twice that of a hospital. The hospital is getting the patient, taking care of the patient prior to surgery, during surgery, and afterwards. And I think we need to ask the question, is that equitable that our manufacturers and suppliers have a higher margin than the healthcare providers. It, it's really not going to be sustainable going forward to generate the capital we need to keep healthcare systems going without looking at this cost structure. And if you look at the EU where we've done a lot of work, the cost of doing the same procedure is much lower in the EU than it is in the U US, even with the same implants. So the question is, what can we do to have a more equitable margin and get our costs down? And that's a huge impact on the financial performance of our organizations is that. Next slide. But um, as a number of people have said, hospitals cannot shrink their way to growth. We can manage our cost, but real growth is going to depend upon taking a strategic approach of how we develop and organize perioperative services system-wide. How we go about expanding our delivery sites, how we look at capturing new surgical volume, either with new procedures or increasingly with surgeons that don't use our facilities. It's heavily dependent upon our primary care network and then leveraging that primary care network to capture the surgeries. And increasingly, patients have a voice as to where they're going to get care. So we've got to structure that experience so we're helping that patient manage their surgical experience not only clinically, but emotionally throughout the course. Before I decided where I was gonna have surgery, I got five separate opinions and looked at five different facilities in all parts of the country. And I chose where I was gonna have surgery, not just on the outcome I expected and the reputation of the surgeon, but how I was treated from the moment I called that surgeon's office to say, I've got a problem, I, I, I'd, I'd like to talk about how you would go about handling it and how that receptionist handled my initial call had a huge impact upon where I decided to have surgery. And two years later, I can actually repeat the question she asked and the level of empathy um, she conveyed 
as soon as I called. And we've got to realize that that's all part of how we organize and deliver care. If I could have the next slide. But increasingly, our focus in health systems is how we grow our ambulatory network. And there's lots of options. You can look at acquiring surgeons owned ASCs in the market. You can develop as a system ambulatory healthcare campuses around multi-surgical specialties, orthopedics, urology, increasingly cardiology is being done on an ambulatory basis and endoscopy and looking at joint ventures of um, single specialty integrated care networks. There is venture capital money and these venture capital funds are totally open to working to health systems, particularly ones that have a large network of surgical specialties that, that are employed. Next one. But hospitals need to move away from just looking at HOPDs because of their higher level of reimbursement. That's shrinking over the years and it's clearly going to um, change. So that what you really want to look at is if we're gonna gauge our surgeons, do we really want to look at opportunities that we can have a joint venture opportunities for our surgeons? Surgeons will go where they make the most money. And in most markets, um, United and Blue Cross will pay a surgeon more money for the same procedure if they're being done in a freestanding ASC than a hospital HOPD. And if a surgeon's gonna make a couple hundred dollars more where the surgeon and the patient typically have as good or better experience, they're gonna be more comfortable going to that facility where they can maximize their time and, and money. And increasingly, ASCs have higher quality outcomes. It's very rare to have an ASC that patients don't have a 95 to 98% satisfaction rate. And it's more efficient. It's a better experience. We've got to look at really where we're going to develop and where we're going to provide our surgical care um, going forward. Next slide. Ambulatory surgery centers really provide more flexibility, and it's especially important given this COVID environment. Until we have a vaccine, patients are going to have anxiety over getting their health care treated in a, any facility. If they're in a freestanding ASC where they're not doing and treating patients with COVID, there's less anxiety. It, it certainly provides greater flexibility during elective surgery shutdowns. There's a lot of markets where the governor and mayor have closed elective surgery in hospitals, but they've allowed them to continue in freestanding ASCs. Piedmont negotiated that recently in, in Atlanta and Georgia. There is, is, is also the ability to recover faster when you have delayed surgeries. It's much easier for an ASC to gear up to peaks. In Chicago, a number of the ASCs were doing surgeries in um, late May and June on not only Saturday, what they called is Surge Saturday, where they were doing single specialties to, to get at the backlog, but they were increasingly doing surgery, particularly on some of the elective procedures on Sunday. And ASC provides a lot of flexibility in terms of cost and scheduling. Next slide. <clears throat> um, the other real opportunity for health systems is to look at acquiring surgeon-owned ASCs. 
ones that were developed 10, 15 years ago, the surgeons are maturing. They're looking at a way to cash out of their investment and younger surgeons are typically reluctant to make an investment like that. So it, surgeons are very open to selling their facility to a hospital. And you, if you're a health system, you would wanna capture that volume before they approached a for-profit venture capital entity to um, acquire them. And then you don't have access to that market. And acquisition also provides faster returns. You don't have to deal with um, the development of a facility, the building up of volume. You get a much faster ROI in a hospital setting if you've acquired a business than um, whether than building it. And it's certainly less capital intense than hospital expansion. So it really allows you to capture this market quickly. And the next slide, this is actually a, a slide from a um, <clears throat> prospectus from a um, for-profit um, surgical facility, again, looking at this venture capital, where they look at focusing on facilities that are integrated. They focus on specialties that have a high margin and what they want to do is they want to mar manage the entire continuum of care. Having freestanding ASCs without supporting physician offices and imaging is not allowing you to capture all of the revenue and, and provide the care that patients are looking at. Next slide. So in, what we're really looking at is that the perioperative systems of the future that are best performing are really focusing on becoming the provider of choice for meeting patients and physicians' needs. And they're working with bonding and meeting that patient's needs from diagnosis to the selection of treatment We've got to communicate with them and talk to them about what their options are through scheduling. The pre-surgical optimization is key, not only helping them to optimize comorbidities, but explaining um, their COVID test and what they need prior to the facility, how they're gonna arrive, who's gonna meet them, just making them aware that we understand the anxiety and we're gonna help them get through it. Helping them to understand their discharge instructions and that our job is, doesn't end when the patient leaves the facility. We need to help them during the recovery process and if they have fears or concerns to provide that support to reduce their anxiety and also to give them the tools so that they have regular communication with us. Communication is key. Next slide. And, and what forward thinking facilities are doing is they're really using technology and apps to help the patient and their families navigate the surgical journey before, during, and after the surgical episode, that the engagement scores of facilities that have embraced this concept is much higher, and surgeons that have integrated this into their practice not only have higher patient satisfaction, but their referrals grow, and by providing this higher level of care, what they've also been able to do is to attract a more favorable payer mix, which is critical in terms of driving any surgical program. Next slide. We can't lose focus of our ability and everything that we've talked about is our job is to deliver value, to deliver great clinical outcomes in lower cost. 
And we've got to look at all sides of that equation in order to, um, to meet that. So that's our job. That's what payers are looking for. That's what patients are looking for. The discriminating patient is willing to pay a higher out of pocket if they're gonna have a better experience and outcome. And we need to make sure that we're doing that. Next slide. Increasingly though, systems are building their primary care network. And more and more physicians are being employed by hospitals and health systems. What we need to understand is that that's the marketing channel that feeds most health system services and it particularly feeds perioperative services. So we want to link that primary care physician with the overall financial implications of how they manage their patients. While we're beginning to move to more productivity-based compensation for primary care physicians, the reason that multi-specialty group practices are successful is that primary care physicians are not only paid on the productivity of their practice, but they're paid on the success of the overall group practice, that we wanna make sure that we incorporate that overall practice financial performance into primary care compensation. Also, when a primary care patient sees a patient in their office, Mrs. Wilson, we've been dealing with this problem with your gallbladder for a while. I think I'd really be more comfortable if you saw a surgeon. When Mrs. Wilson leaves that primary care office and is checking out, we want to make sure, oh, I see Dr. Swain has suggested that you see a surgeon. We have a lot of surgeons that we work with. Can I schedule you with one now? We don't want to lose that patient and capture that surgical experience while we're interacting with that patient. It's also important that we have same day appointments for urgent surgical problems. We're looking at a lot of practices and the payer mix of a surgical practice improves if they have some evening hours just till seven o'clock and one or two Saturday mornings a week where they'll see patients because we want to capture the patients that are working, that have good insurance coverage, and they typically can't take time off from work during the day to come and see a physician. So we've got to think through every part of the experience and, and, and what we're really doing to, to drive that experience and to, to drive care. So what I'd like to conclude, if I could add the next slide with, is as Rick and I have hopefully explained, we really believe that perioperative services offer a ladder for health systems and hospitals to climb out of the financial stress that's being caused by COVID. The checklist of what you as a health system leader want to think about is, do we have a strategy that offers our patients a broad network of offsite ASCs? Are we looking at building ambulatory campuses that integrate physicians, surgical care, rehabilitation and treatment as part of that experience? Have we followed the advice of Rick where we're empowering physicians to help us drive our strategy both operationally and strategically? Because if physicians are part of the strategy and part of the solution, they will make sure that they overcome barriers and those strategies are achieved. We want to focus on having 
very clear financial and market goals and tie everything we're doing to those goals. We really need to focus on that patient experience from the moment they call to schedule to how we go about helping that patient prepare for surgery. And we want to be in contact with them in recovery and rehabilitation. An app provides that continuity. We're gonna have to reduce our cost. The margins are not gonna be there in healthcare. And there's a lot of opportunities to reduce our cost, not only internally, but in our negotiations with our vendors. And again, what we want to do is, what we want to do is to focus on growth. Next slide. So I think what we really want to do is thank you for taking the time um, to meet with us. And, and certainly if you've got any questions of Rick and I, you can email us and reach out to us and we would be happy to answer it. Have a wonderful day and stay safe. Thanks for taking the time.